The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by SportsOfAnarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by SubmissionFC.com. Enter the promo code SportsOfAnarchy10 for 10% off the best Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gear. We're also brought to you by the Flex Belt. Summer's approaching fast. If you want to strengthen and tone your abs, the Flex Belt, which is FDA cleared, could just be for you. Follow the link in the description below to get your very own. The MMA Discussion Podcast is now available to listen to on iTunes and the radio podcast app Stitcher, which are both available for free on all smartphone devices for download. Ladies and gentlemen, for the 33rd episode of our MMA Discussion Podcast, I am brought to you here with a very special guest, former UFC f- uh, fighter, former Bellator fighter, and now current World Series of Fighting Fighter, Clifford Starks. Great to have you on, man. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. For sure, man. Um, you're a very interesting guest. You've been uh, a lot of places, you know, having been uh, fighting for the top, what, what some would say the top three organizations in, in MMA today. Um, first of all, I want to ask, uh, how have you enjoyed your time thus far with your current promotion, World Series of Fighting? You know, they've treated me very well. Uh, I appreciate everything they've done. Very organized, and um, it's just great to be fighting high-level competition. Most recently, you're coming off uh, your debut against Jake Hewen. Uh, you got a uh, you got a submission arm triangle choke. Um, that was March 28th, not too long ago. Um, I want to ask. Thus far, you've actually coming off two submission wins, both one in Bellator and one in World Series of Fighting. Since uh, since your stint off the UFC, you've actually um, seemed to be doing much better. Has there been any drastic improvement? Has there been any tra- uh, changes to your training lately that have uh, Cause this? Yeah, you know, when I got into the UFC, I was still very new in the game. Uh, I actually got caught in a submission by Ed Herman. Um, it was my second fight in the UFC. And I was kind of tailoring my game. Trevor Lawley, my head coach, actually kind of knew if we would have gone to the ground, I would have been in trouble. And that's just from lack of experience. So since then, I've really been boning up on my Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, and uh, everything's just starting to come together, and it's clicking very well now. Do you seem to favor jujitsu more, or is there any part of your style of game that you, you you yourself feel like you're specialized in? I really don't feel particularly specialized in any area because I feel if you're well-rounded, you're, you make yourself dangerous in all areas. So, I mean, even against Jake Hewen, I did get him with a submission, but what set up the submission was the punches to the wrestling to the jiu-jitsu. So it just seems that when you put it together, it just makes it a much easier fight. Yeah, it certainly seems that way with your record. You're 11-2, and two, uh, six of those are finishes, and then you split those in half. Those are your submission and knockout wins. So um, you certainly seem to be very well-rounded. Um, I, I want to say that, you, you know... Um, you're, you're 33, not the, the youngest guy in the game, but you started when you were 27. That seems a little late for most fighters that come into the MMA these days. But um, you seem to have uh, you seem to have had a, a very very decorated uh, athletic career in your younger days. You know, you competed in wrestling, football, and track and field and such. And uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, what is it that got you to compete in, in MMA in the first place? You know. Just like you said, I competed when I was younger, and I I missed the competition. And the great part is I get get paid, and I get to compete at the same time. So I was was looking for something to kind of get it going again. I actually looked into bodybuilding and did a couple bodybuilding shows as well. And it just wasn't – it really wasn't doing what I wanted it to do for my competition. So – I got into MMA, gave it a try, and it just it fueled the fire that I was looking for. Well, um, I would assume that's coming off of having wrestled. You wrestled for Arizona State. Um, uh, I wanted to ask, you competed in, uh, in the NCAA Division One team, correct? Yes. Was that um, was that around the time that Cain Velasquez was, was wrestling? It was, actually. We've uh, been around each other for a while. Uh, he... Uh, he used to wrestle at Yuma Kofa, and I was a Mountain Point wrestler. And um, we had gone back and forth in high school, and then when I ended up going to ASU, um, I, I uh, wrestled off with every position, and Kane ended up co- 
coming in, and I kind of was like, ah, oh, here we go again. Like, I, he's always been a tough opponent. As you know, he's the UFC champion, mm-hmm. heavyweight. So, um, yeah. me and him have had a lot of back and forth goes, and he's actually part of the reason I'm as competitive as I am today. Oh, wow. Have you, um, how, how long did you wrestle with him for, like, in, in college? Were you the same year? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, me and him wrestled in college together for two years. Wow. Yeah. So coming off of of, of, uh, of your wrestling career, um, by the way, it says you finished third place here in the Pac-10, which is actually really impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, coming off of that, what, what is it um, after so that, that led you to MMA? Like, who did you – start training with initially who, who got you on who would, how would you say you got on this path to your early career um i started at la boxing a friend of mine richie hightower had talked to me about mma he had been competing for a few years already and um told me to join his team so i i tried it out over there uh, good guys good coaches um then i went back to uh, Arizona Combat where Ryan Bader and C.B. Dalloway and Aaron Simpson were just to kind of train with guys closer to my size. Mm -hmm. And I uh, ended up falling in love with Arizona Combat. Um, They eventually started their own spot, Power. I go over there to train from time to time, but uh, Arizona Combat's my spot, and I'm very loyal to the owner there, Trevor Lolly. So I've I've been there a little over six years now. Six wow. Yeah, so that's about all your career, correct? Almost. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Um well I wanted to ask you also um with with coming off the UFC you actually competed for Bellator for two fights and um oddly enough you won both of those fights, but you didn't come back for a third fight or it was never announced that you were cut or anything. Um, what was it that transitioned you from Bellator to World Series of Fighting? Uh, I just need to stay active. So um, I did like fighting for Bellator. They're a great organization as well. But uh, WSOF gave me an offer and um, I just I, I need to stay active because I, I think that's going to help consistently improve my fighting career and move me in the direction I need to go into. Have you ever, um, what, was there a, you were, there wasn't no contract issues or anything where you had, or you were just able to say, hey, I have an offer, um, release me or anything like that? No, I actually signed a singular contract with them. Both oh. times, so. Oh, yeah, just a singular one fight. fight contract with Bellator? Yeah, one fight contract, Oh, that yes. makes sense, okay. Uh, okay, that makes sense because there's a lot of uh, fighters outside of the U.S. that sign contracts like those. So, um, yes, yeah, you rarely ever hear of, of guys in the states actually signing those. Though, um, I wanted to ask, what, like, you've competed for all three in in the uh, in your uh, short career thus far. Um, how do you uh, how 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 would you say the difference is between all three, and what what would be your favorite thus far as far as upcoming into a fight? You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, they all have their own flavor of um, how, how they approach everything. Very business-oriented in their own ways. I really do like WSOF because it's not quite as large. And it, like, I mean, if I was it, uh, on the inside with Dana White, it'd be great with the UFC. But unfortunately, I'm not. And I, I got to get there, and I'm trying to get there. But it's such the UFC is such a large organization that he has he has so many people to choose from. It's harder to get noticed. Versus at uh, WSOF and Bellator, they're they're kind of up and coming versus being established. If that makes sense. Definitely. So so yeah, I'm just trying to. Um, establish myself as a fighter do you feel that like that uh that that uh relieves pressure when you compete for the world series of fighting as opposed to when you were competing for the ufc yeah in terms of pressure it's um not more or less because i'm i'm fighting regardless and everybody's gonna try and 
take your head off, but it's nice to know that your boss knows your name. Yeah, that's cool. I wanted to also ask you, thus far, you're in the World Series of Fighting. You, uh, thus far, you've had a great run uh, since your uh, since your um, um, release from the UFC. What are your plans? Do you plan on staying with World Series of Fighting long term? Is your goal to get back to the UFC? What are your goals? Oh, that's a tough one. The fight game's weird that way. I'm just looking to take it, honestly, one win at a time. And then um, see what, what uh, opportunities present itself. I, I want to fight the best in the world. Uh, right now, the best in the world are in the UFC. So if, if uh, it maintains to stay that way then I'd like to find the UFC and and be a top contender and champion before if the opportunity presents itself in the World Series of Fighting or would you look for an opportunity to fight Dave Branch for the middleweight belt oh yeah it actually did present itself unfortunately a couple things happened in the wake of that I was actually supposed to be fighting for that title if I beat the guy named Krasmir Madanov, and unfortunately he got hurt before our fight. Mm. So that led up to another fighter, and then the whole the, the card got a little messy, and so everybody had to get bumped up, and that, that led to JQ. But yeah, hopefully I, I do have the opportunity to fight Dave Branch soon in the future. Do you feel like one more good uh, performance like that would get you that? Um, it should. I mean, I don't see why not. How do you, uh, well, actually, uh, let me ask this first. Who, who, do you have anybody in specific in mind that you'd like to fight next that could get you that shot? Uh, I, I really want to tangle with Krasmir Madanov. I want to, I want to finish unfinished business. He was the guy I was training for all camp. And, I mean, I know things happen sometimes, and it's unfortunate. I hope I hope he has a healthy recovery and a speedy recovery, but I would like to get that opportunity. And with that, if should should you win that fight and then get a, an opportunity at Dave Branch in the middleweight title, how do you uh, how do you see yourself doing in that fight? I see myself beating him. Uh, I see it being a difficult fight. He's a he's a definitely a competitor. He's consistently improving. He's strong everywhere. Um, and I, that's those are the best fights. It's gonna be fun. He's gonna be a, a challenge. I know he knows I'm gonna be a challenge. And we're gonna go out there and may the better man win. Now you're signed with World Series of Fighting, which is great. I've uh, been looking forward to having somebody from that organization on here. We've had guys from Bellator talk about Scott Coker and guys from UFC talk about Dean White. I haven't had anybody come on and actually talk about Ray Seffo, and I don't really hear a lot of fighters talk about him. Is like, have you had any contact with him, and, and what is your general opinion if you have about him? Like, what's um? What? Yeah, we spoke a little bit. It's really difficult for me to give an exact opinion on him because I've only spoken to him a couple times. I actually trained at Extreme Couture and I met him there. And uh, I told him if he needed any fighters to contact me, and luckily enough, he, he has. Um, from what I've seen so far, I see, he seems like a cool, legit guy. And, you know, he'll, he, um, I haven't had any problems with him, no complaints with him. He, um, uh, I actually speak with the uh, fight, the fight ma matchmaker, Ali. Mm -hmm. So that's been the guy who's really been contacting me and keeping me in touch with what's going on and what to do next. He's certainly the guy that he's like he's the matchmaker, correct? Yes. Which is funny because you know um, guys like Joe Silva, guys like Sean Shelby, ma uh, the matchmaker at Bellator, they, they don't really stay in the public eye too much. Ray Seffo is like the opposite with uh, with Ali. That Ali is the guy who really comes out into the public and speaks, and on behalf of the company more so. What about him? Have you spoken to him and any opinions on him lately? Yeah, I mean, um, he keeps it simple and forward. He, he tells me what's up, and uh, either I can say a yes or no, like <laughs> to the fight. You know, they mm -hmm. they put me in a position to. Um, 
on who I need to fight, and they know I want the title, and they tell me who I need to fight to get to that opportunity to get the title. Awesome. Well, there's an event coming up in June, uh, World Series of Fighting 21. Do you want to fight on that card, or do you have like a, a, a longer time stamp of when you want to uh, compete? You know, it's funny. Uh, I was actually thinking about the Okami fight, because I know Ryan Ford got hurt. He's oh wow! On one, yeah, he's a yeah. he's fight. He was supposed to fight him at 170. I don't know if Okami would be willing to fight me at 185 since he's going down to 170. But like I said, I want to compete with the best, and Okami's one of the best. Actually, it says here that Ryan Ford. I was actually moving up to face him at middleweight, and I, I, I'd be very shocked if Okami, as big a guy as he is, could make welterweight. I think that fight would be great. I think that'd be a you'd be an excellent replacement in getting uh getting that shot against uh Yushin Okami, and should you get that fight, um how do you, how do you see yourself doing in that in that fight? Uh, I I think there's certain areas that I'm definitely stronger than him, and I think he has areas where he's stronger than me, and I'm I'm gonna try and dictate where we go. That sounds and keep great. it keep it in my keep it in my favor to win the fight. Now you've uh you've competed against uh um Yoel Romero in your career and he's actually gone to uh, great lengths to get to get near contendership uh thus far. Um yeah. what are your opinions on him and um would you ever want to get that fight back should you ever make it back to the UFC? Oh god, I think about that fight all the time. Of course <laughs> I want that fight back. <laughs> Every time I see a highlight, that's the that's the fight I see, and uh, I want to put a highlight reel in him. Nice. He's, he's explosive. He's a great athlete. Um, a lot of respect for him. Again, he was an Olympian, silver medalist. So he's uh he's definitely put in the work. But I I know I can beat him, and uh, I. I did. I feel I didn't get to showcase what I could do in that fight, and it just that's the way it happens sometimes. But mm -hmm. if the opportunity presents itself, oh god, I definitely want that fight back. Awesome. Well, I have a couple of uh, fan questions here. Uh, if you're willing to answer any of them for uh, the fans that have uh, sent uh, sent me a couple emails and such that uh, want to get to ask you. Yeah. First fight comes from a guy named um, Jack. Lins Lyonsky? Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Jack. Uh, he asks, um, how many years do you see yourself competing, and uh, do you feel like it's a matter of, of taking care of yourself and less injuries to be able to prolong your career? Yeah, you know, since I started at 27, I feel I can compete until my late 30s, early 40s, actually. So, yeah, big thing is making sure I eat correctly. Nutrition's key. Uh, take care of my joints, and I have to um, just condition your body properly. A lot of people, I think, may be overtraining themselves, and that's why the injuries occur so often when they're getting ready for fights. Uh, I was a kinesiology major at ASU, so I know the in and outs of how to take care of your body and how to eat properly, and you'd be surprised the body's an amazing machine if you take care of it. Awesome. Next question comes to us from um, Ali Kermov. Yeah, Ali Kermov. Ali Kermov asks, which victory upon your uh, in your short career do you feel was the most exciting or most, uh, I guess they meant to write, um, ravishing? Meaning, you know, like wh which fight thus far of your career, which highlight do you feel is your most spectacular? Uh, most spectacular right now would have to be the Kobe Ortiz fight. Uh, me and him spoke in the back, great guy. But when you put someone to sleep, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing better than that, especially when it's coming from a submission. Mm -hmm. Another question asks, if you got the opportunity, would you fight for Bellator again? And they also asked, why did you leave? But we got that answer already. <laughs> Again, the champion is Brandon Halsey. I'm actually kind of surprised um, 
the challenger they have right now, Kendall Grove. Yeah. Great oh, fighter, yeah. but it's I I don't know. It's not like he's on a winning streak right now. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of I don't know. That was kind of weird to me, but um, they if they make it work, they make it work. So, but what I I would love to fight for Bellator again if yeah. the opportunity was presenting itself and in the right in the right order yeah certainly it seems that you know from middleweight and up they, they've always had a kind of a shallow pool of contenders for their champions um and yeah, yeah. from what i understand kendall grove has only won one fight uh, since coming to bellator and uh with that one win gets him a title shot very fortunate for him probably also going yeah. off name value as well <laughs> yeah that's what i was thinking we have another question here asks um what do you uh this is by um Callie Herso. He asked what do you feel about the uh the way that they handle uh drug testing in World Series of Fighting and what are your overall thoughts on the matter in general? I honestly hope they start doing more randomized drug testing because a couple people have been popped and I'm I'm really happy they're finally getting popped. Uh, I'm gonna keep it very uh anonymous but uh i i know doctors who can and, um basically put it in a way where you will pass all of your stuff and i don't i think that's unfortunate that it is, is that way because there's other fighters who either can't afford it or who want want the game to be fair <laughs> and it's just it makes it clearly unfair therefore calling it a performance enhancer it's it's um it needs to be cleaned up for sure and um i'm glad they're finally going in the direction to clean it up awesome and uh our final question here by a fan um on twitter asks this is um christopher cardenas and he asks what do you feel um about your striking that uh that could use no oh, I'm sorry wait a minute I misspoke on this one he asks your striking seems to be uh getting better according to your last fight who do you attribute this uh this improvement to uh that's definitely Trevor Lolly and Todd Lolly over at the uh combat sports Arizona combat mm -hmm. and also Jamerson White as well is another trainer there my own personal question here actually like what do you feel that you need to improve on the most if anything on the most would I would say transitions just because you can always improve on your transitions so timing putting it all together like uh, for instance Kane Kane Velasquez his wrestling to boxing transitions are amazing mm -hmm. one of the best and that's what makes him s such a dangerous fighter where you don't know is he gonna box me is he gonna wrestle me is he gonna kickbox me was he and he'll go back and forth in different transitions very quickly so i think that's probably what i could improve on most very good answer yeah but another one of the fighters that i can think of off the top of my head that are very uh very good at, uh, at that as far as you know uh you know changing levels from boxing to takedowns is uh frankie edgar um yeah, yes so you, uh, what about? Do you also mean transitioning on the ground? I feel like that's a very underrated part of, of of any grappler's game plan. Many guys are content to take guys down and hold them in the guard and use ground and pound. But I feel like you know also being able to, and it's very tough for sure to be able to learn, uh, you know, to uh, to really specialize in transitioning on the ground, especially when you, uh, it, it's always dependent on the level of uh, grappling that the, your opponent has when it comes to holding you in your guard and being able to. Um, keep you from transitioning but do you feel like that's also a, a, a that for me i feel like it's a very underrated part of fighting being able to pass the guard oh, being time. able to yeah, yeah. and not only like um again being on the ground that's a a transition in itself when you're going from punching to okay now i'm going to pass the guard now i'm going to like yeah that's transitioning within itself too mm -hmm. so yeah i completely agree with that I also wanted to ask the last question. Did do you feel um that if you had to pick one style of fighting thus far in your arsenal, what would you start with, or would you just keep it all the same, going from wrestling first to where you've gotten thus far? 
Um, yeah, I'd stick with what I've, what I've been doing so far. I, I like my style and, uh, it works for me. I, I have a lot more that the world hasn't seen yet and I'm hoping to show that just bits at a time. (laughs) Don't want to show it all at once. Well, I can't wait to see you get back in there thus far. And right now I've got, uh, uh, you know, you've given me the great idea of hoping to see you in there with Yushin Okami next. I definitely would like to see you in that fight next. I'm sure the fans of this podcast will as well. Um, we appreciate you having uh, having you on. You've been an awesome guest and uh, I've learned a lot about you. And uh, we, we would love to have you back on again, especially if that fight gets signed. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. We appreciate your time, man. And, um, you know, where can guys reach you on social media? Uh, you can reach me on my Facebook, just go to uh, Clifford Starks, or you can re- reach me on my Twitter account, which is Clifford Starks 1. Uh, Clifford, Mr. Starks, we appreciate the time. You've been an awesome guest, and like I said again, once you get a fight signed up, we would love to have you back on, and can't wait to see you compete in there again. Awesome, sounds good. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. And that was Clifford Starks. Uh, current World Series of Fighting Fighter. That was a great interview, I gotta say, for myself. And now, here I am with also MMA D admin Jonas. Bro, how are you doing, brother? Oh, things are good, man. Heck of a week, and uh, especially these last couple of days, with uh, all the events going on. So, uh, definitely. so we've got a lot to talk about. Oh, Even though I did man. miss the uh, UFC card, I had to work. So you know. It was before the thrills, right? So yeah, I'll be able to talk you through it, especially how the fights went. You missed a really good main card. That main card was definitely great. The undercard itself was all right for sure, but it wasn't like there wasn't too much noteworthy. Um, for whatever it was, I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, certainly, the header of the prelims, Leon Edwards, who took on Seth Pazinski, had the most. Uh, uh, prolific highlight of the night, even next to Crow Cops, where he was able to knock out Seth Pazinski in eight seconds with three punches. <laughs> that was it. He threw three punches. Dude was – well, actually, he just threw one punch. Seth got dropped, and then he threw two more to follow up, and then it was over. It was a, a very good highlight. I'll be sure to send that to you, Jonas, because we actually have that. Um, I have that on the phone, so I'll, get, I'll make sure to send that to you. Deal. Um, yeah. And uh, we'll just go over the main card real quick. There was also a a, a, a a wonderful highlight off of Marina Moroz, who took on Joanna Calderwood. Now, not many people gave her a chance. And right. let me tell yeah, you what. I, I sure didn't see that one coming. Yeah, let me tell you what. Joanna didn't seem to look like all herself in there. And that Marina, uh, this Miss Monroe's here, looked absolutely ready and fired up and went in there and took care of business, man. Like, she went in there confident. The second, man, she pulled guard. That's how confident she was in her in her ground game. She got put against the fence and then just took an angle and pulled guard. Pulled guard, went after the arm and got it. It was ter- it was just fantastic jits. I was I was very surprised. Um, not only that, but this girl took not only not only did she take on Joanna Calderwood, the number what five ranked uh, straw weight in the world right now. She beat her, gave her her first le- first legitimate loss. And went right after Joanna or Joanna Jet, uh, Young J Chick, who was in the audience, of course, had her stand up, told her, "Hey, I'm calling you out. I want you next. I want a shot at that title." Con- like, you know, like it, it, she did the best kind. Of, you know how we were talking about this the other day, not on the podcast, but we were talking about this the other day where fighters come out and they just need, man, if they would just be more vocal about what it is they want they don't have to be disrespectful they don't have to be rude they don't have to be mean they just gotta call out hey i want a shot at the belt or i want to fight this guy he'll give me a chance to the belt you know we talked about that the other day remember yeah and, yeah yeah definitely and, uh, and she definitely. did that 100 percent. she pulled that out she she got asked what do you want to do next it's like you know what i want she's right there i want her and then pointed at her and say hey look you and me let's do it i want a shot at that belt didn't disrespect her didn't flip rob didn't call her no names didn't call her Call her trash. Told her, "Hey, I know she's a good fighter, but I'm a badass fighter, and I want to get in there with her." And I and I and I was just blown away by her. I, I'm I'm a fan immediately. This chick did everything right in there. I'm gonna tell you what though. I think her uh, inter- her interpreter really fucked it up because there were questions that she was getting asked by Dan Hardy that she wasn't fully answering, um, according to the interpreter. And I feel like it was his fault. <laughs> but yeah, shocker enough, we didn't see him the rest of the night. <laughs> um, but um. 
she did a great job. She called out who she wanted to fight. That division is wide open. With that kind of performance, who knows? She could get a title shot. You know, that division is wide open right now for, for anybody to come up and take on Young Jacek. Um, and uh, Young Jacek looked game. She got out of her seat. She went near the cage. She she said, let's do it. And said, bring it on. And, you know, uh, how she would do against a striker of Joanna's caliber, I don't know. But she was able to, of course, take advantage of a striker of, of, of – uh, of Calderwoods, you know, so she uh she's definitely proved she's game. Still undefeated, she's six and zero. So is uh Young J Chick. So that makes for an exciting fight already, um if it happens. So I mean, you know, those are the two stars of the night, and sure enough, they both got performance of the night. Uh, you know, uh what was it, Marina Moroz and uh, Leon Edwards, and then uh, it went on to <laughs> this very very odd car uh, odd fight that uh I'm gonna try and pronounce his name right real quick. Hold on. Powell Pollock. No, I could. I may have messed that up. You know me. I suck with last sounds names. Right. <laughs> huh? That sounds about right. That sounds about right. Sounds about as good as it's gonna get. That's what it sounds yeah. like. So, <laughs> but uh, I, I was excited about him going into this fight already. He seemed like a very great striker. Now Sheldon Westcott used to fight at middleweight, and immediately off the bat, I had actually picked Pollock to win. I picked him because, you know, I just thought maybe his striking would be good enough to take down Westcott. I didn't even take into account how good of a, a wrestler Westcott is. But watching this fight, I was just like, man, this – let me tell you what. People were rooting for Westcott, but I, Westcott didn't even bring the fight. He didn't bring the fight at all. All he did was throw petty strikes and then keep Pollock against the cage and kept looking for a takedown, but barely did anything else. He didn't try and attack. He didn't throw knees. He didn't throw too many punches um, in the clinch while keeping Pollock against the cage. And so the fight was being the, – the fight was just going. It was just going with Pollock against the cage. But every single time that Pollock could find himself off the cage, he made a count. He uh, attacked. He was obviously the much better striker. He was able to attack with kicks and um, punches, and even was able and lost the first round because of that uh, to Westcott because he had held him to the cage like for four straight, well not straight, but like four consecutive minutes. Like anytime the ref would break it up, he'd put him right back against the cage. And then the second right. round happens. Pollock is able to, um, you know, whenever he does find freedom, he's able to put the beat down on him. And then in the last minute of that round. Um, with nothing happening because of Westcott continuously putting him against the cage, uh, Pollock is actually able to find uh, find those strikes. He actually lands a great knee on uh, on Westcott, drops him, gets that round back because afterwards he attacks him, isn't able to finish, but got very close, found his back, and kept attacking. Um, who knows what he could have done with thir 30 more seconds, you know what I mean? And then so going into the third round, more of the same from Westcott, holding him against the cage, not being offensive, avoiding the fight in my opinion. And then Pollock out of nowhere finds this judo throw that was just so slick. Threw him. his He wore the earth for a hat for a second. It was great. I loved it. He put him on his back, and then he put, he went from half guard, transitioned to side control, landed some more ground and pound, then got to north-south position, and what he did was slick. He put his knee against Westcott's neck <laughs> and just kept his head there so he could punch it. <laughs> it was awesome. It was, like, it was some very creative form of ground and pound. And um, – Sure enough, the ground and pound, uh, he, he was able to, you know, take full advantage, won that round off of the strikes. Westcott still trying to keep him against the cage, but it just, it, it wasn't happening. Pollock was able to tire him out and, and, and couldn't be kept there, even though he was the easy, he was the much smaller guy. Westcott used to fight at, at middleweight, and even though he, of course, can make the welterweight limit, um, he was the bigger guy, but Pollock didn't let that bug him and uh, took advantage of his strengths and even was able to take him to the ground and beat him there. So, you know, it, it was an overall great performance on Pollock's uh, part. He made that a fun fight to watch, only him. <laughs> so uh, overall great performance uh, in that welterweight bout. And then the co-main event, Jimmy Manoa taking on Jan Blauchowicz. Blau 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 Blockovich. Blau there you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, now I I always refer to him as JSW, um, and I've seen him fight before, and he's looked great. He didn't look that great uh, yesterday. He didn't he didn't. I mean, uh, he's usually a slow starter, 
But even then, his strikes are so powerful, definitely he puts guys uh, on notice. And he did with Jimmy. He landed great shots, good uppercuts, um, counter uh, counter hooks, but he just wasn't throwing the kind of volume Jimmy was throwing. Jimmy just ate everything that he was getting hit with and kept coming forward. And uh, that's basically the story of the fight. He kept coming forward through more volume, didn't land the harder punches, but he landed the, the cleaner strikes, such as kicks and such. Jan was more boxing-oriented in this fight than anything, so... With that being said, that's why Jimmy took the the clear decision, in my opinion, won the fight uh, fair, fair and square. And then, uh, of course, in the main event, the highlight of the whole weekend for for hardcore fans, I would assume, um, Gabriel Gonzaga versus Mirko Krokop. And, man, Mirko had everything going on against him. First of all, he was taking on the guy who gave him the worst loss of his career. He was the 4-1 to underdog. He, uh, you know, uh, he's, what, nearly 40 now. And, um... You know, and, and, you know, it just, it seemed like the odds were against him. And Gabriel, for all his, you know, faults and, 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 and setbacks in the past couple of years, uh, is still a legitimate fighter. He still fought um, great competition and still ha uh, hung with some of the best of them. And uh, so, you know, going into this fight, I, I, I felt like there was something. You know me. I did call on the last podcast that Mirko could win, but I understood yeah. why. People were doubting him. I, I, I was able to understand that. And sure enough, Gabriel took the first two rounds. He was able to take Mirko down, kept him down. He found the mount numerous times and actually uh, hurt Mirko, opened him up um, with elbows and punches. And, and, you know, Mirko was able to survive more of the same in the first two rounds. And then so, you know, of course, the third round comes around and I'm just like, man, it doesn't look like it's going to happen, you know. Out of nowhere, Gabriel puts him against the cage. You saw the finish, right? Yeah, I saw the finish. Puts him against the cage. Krokop hits him with an elbow, and all of a sudden, Gabriel's on the defensive, and Mirko just went after it, man. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was Oh, man. Was, wow. I'll tell you what. I was losing it. I, me and Blaze were, like, talking at the same time to each other, and we were just losing it. We were... The second he dropped him, I was like, oh, shit, this could be it. It could happen. And then Gabriel is actually able to put him in his guard. From there, I was thinking, shit, you know, because Krokop, you know, I mean, Gonzaga with his guard, you know, is is, de is decent defensively, you know. Right. Yeah. But Mirko pounded him with those elbows and and then looked for the hammer fist, got the finish, put, in a, uh, put the nostalgia in fans, and it was awesome. I mean, he, he looked as vicious as, as the old Krokop. I'll say that right now. I mean, he hasn't looked that game in a fight in such a long time. And, um. Man, I called it. I was so happy. I not only called that, I called the round. I was so happy. Um, yeah, man. Good for Crow Cop. I was, I was <laughs> ecstatic, yeah, he, man. <laughs> I remember getting the message on you. I called it, man. Called it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just, man. That was a great fight. I was, um, you know, ecstatic. A lot of fans were, and uh, I gotta say, man, I posted a video of the finish and, um, you know, that I that I took of, and uh, holy shit. All kinds of people were watching that damn thing. Um, got, uh, you know, uh, that was uh, overall great main card for sure. The prelims were decent, more decent than even I thought they would have been. Um, uh, it was overall a great card in my opinion. P uh, Polish fans are awesome too. Those guys were rooting for anything and everything that they could. They, I'm sure they had a great time. Uh, overall, I think the UFC had a success with that with that fight card. I don't know in viewers, but certainly with the with the crowd and attendance, it seemed packed. Um, so overall, it was a great card, I think, for the UFC uh, in the end. So uh, with that, I mean, let's talk about what what we think should be going on next for the main card here. I think Mirko, um, man, who do you think he should fight next? If he should fight next at all, if you think that. I know. Look, I talked to Adam about this. I don't think he he wants. I think he wants to see Mirko go out on a win, avenging his worst loss of his career. I mean, that's that's about as good as it can get for him. But uh, hey, if he wants to fight again, I can't say that I'm totally against that. It's not like he looked horrible against uh, Gonzaga. You know, he he was able to get a really nice finish. You know, from what I saw. Mm -hmm. So um, let's see, Krokop fight. Well, it has to be somebody. Uh, Noteworthy. We can't just give Krokop some nobody, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Krokop and. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's hard. You know what I mean? Really I, I wouldn't be totally opposed to him fighting Roy Nelson. 
Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, and the reason why is because, you know, first of all, Mirko is now 6-0 and in rematches. He's undefeated in rematches over the course of his career. It's a pretty cool stat to have. And yeah. I think he would pose a better fight to Roy Nelson only because of Roy Nelson. Roy Nelson beat Crow Cop utilizing what really made him a good fighter going into the UFC, which was his amazing ground game. You know, um, he utilized great wrestling and and, um, and grappling to, to, to put Mirko on his back, get on top, and of course finish him from there. Um, I don't. Roy Nelson doesn't fight like that anymore, though. You know, I mean, he would really have to work on that and utilize that should they rematch. Um, I don't know if they will, but if they did, that 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 would be the. Uh, uh, I think Mirko would have a, stand a better chance in that fight, especially with in the past he's been working more so on his kickboxing. I think he he'd be uh, he'd be more up to par in striking with Roy this time around, especially. Um, you know, or uh, or Arlovsky. I heard I heard that name got thrown around. I know Arlovsky's oh, taking on Travis Brown. Say he loses that. I mean, I guess you could put those two together. I don't know if they've ever fought. I don't think they have. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't think they have. That would be good. Be um, speaking of rematches, I mean, what what about Frank? What about Frank Mir? Maybe. I mean, Frank Mir is supposed. I mean, is as is going to main event against Todd Duffy. If he, I don't, uh, I don't know what circumstance it would be for Frank Mir after that fight for him to fight Crow Cop next. I guess if Frank Mir wins, then yeah, put him against uh, Crow Cop because then it makes sense a little bit. If he lost, it would it would make less sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, it would. Yeah, so, I mean, that could be a great fight, too. Yeah, and, you know, it, it, the only reason why people wouldn't, won't think of that fight immediately is strictly because, um, you know, the first fight was kind of a blunder. <laughs> yeah. If you watch the first fight, it was it was three rounds of them just kind of clenching the whole time until Frank Mir threw a knee out of nowhere yeah, and knocked Crow yeah. Cup out. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know. It, it would be uh, – I think it would be a risky call just because of how that first fight went. Um, so I don't know. Well, how about somebody else that hasn't been so busy like uh, Josh Barnett? Ooh, I believe he's fought Josh, Josh three times and beaten him three times. Oh, he has? Yeah. He fought yeah, Josh. He yeah, he's beaten Josh three times. Yeah. He defeat, He beat him once at Pride 28 with a, a shoulder injury. He beat him at Pride 30 um, and then beat him uh, – he beat him into submission at like a pride conflict fight. So he's beaten Josh three times. I don't think a fourth fight of <laughs> when you've beaten yeah, somebody happened. three times, you know what I mean? That's not happening. Yeah. So uh, with that, I don't know. Let me think. Uh, if Alistair Overeem wasn't doing so hot, I'd say him. Because they fought before, but um, what is it? It was a no contest the first time they fought. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, let's think. I don't know. There's a lot of uh, options definitely out there for Crow Cop, especially now that he's won. People are, are 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 very open to seeing him fight again. Yeah, they're back on the wagon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly um, it certainly makes sense for for me. I don't know. What about Big Now? How many times have they fought? I know they've had two really good fights. Um, you think? Because Big Nog has two fights. He's going to fight Struve next. What about after that fight? Should he continue to want to fight? You know what I mean? So he has lost to Nogueira once, and that's it. So just one fight. That's only been one fight between him. I'm thinking of the other Nogueira. Oh, um, there you go. Another rematch. Yeah, another rematch. I mean, he's undefeated in rematches, so, you know, why wouldn't it be cool to see him fight a, again? You know what I mean? Um, Pro Cop Revenge Tour. <laughs> We'll see what happens, man. I'm excited to see him fight again, and uh, we'll see what happens. Hell, he might even get a rematch with Alexi Olenek, the guy that submitted him before he made his way to the UFC. So. Yeah, yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah, just looking at Crow Cop's record, man, tw 31 wins, 23 knockouts. It's freaking crazy. Dude puts it on you, man. Yeah, that only, leg, man. Only three decision wins ever in all of his career. It's pretty crazy. And three decision losses, so out of the, what, the 44 times he's fought, 38 of them didn't stopped. go the distance. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy, man. That just shows you the career he's had, for sure. He's had a wild career, for sure. Yep. He's either going to finish you or he's going to lose badly. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of guy he is. And, you know, I, I dig that, you know. 
Yeah. That's, like that's why that's why many people love him, man. He goes out there, man. He puts it on dudes. He goes after it, no matter what, even in his old age, especially in his old age. Now it seems he's done really well since leaving the UFC the first time. He went he went what? Um I believe he went nine and two in combat sports in both kickboxing and MMA. Nine and two after, yeah. after he left. Yeah. That's not bad. You know what I mean? The only loss in MMA was to Olinick, who is in the UFC now. So um, you know, we'll see how he's doing. I mean, you know, I don't know what changes he's made. I, I would like to know, but whatever changes he's made to his training uh, thus far now, uh, I would like to know. He did train for Steve Amy. He did train with Steve Amy Ochich for this fight. Who knows? Maybe training with higher caliber fighters these days will help him. We'll see what happens. Um, that being said, we'll move on to the other two cards that happened last Friday on the 10th. Uh, Bellator 136 and World Series of Fighting. Um, while each card had some of their moments, uh, World Series of Fighting had had a lot of issues going into their card for sure. Um, Dude, gosh, I mean, yeah, day before the they, fight, Ronnie Marks they, gets Marks pulled out. out. Yeah, that was horrible. And then got and then got and then Branch basically got given a, another possible Rocky story, but you know, put away Jesse McGill pretty pretty soundly with a Von Flu choke. Um, yeah. Yeah, Man, I didn't even, when the submission happened, we didn't even see it. We were just like, wait, he's out. What the fuck? You know? <laughs> yeah, I, and I, then I turned around. Yeah, I didn't even see something. the pressure he was putting on his neck with his shoulder until you re watched the, re the replay, and I was just like, whoa. Yeah, I watched the replay, and like, okay, that yeah, that was a bomb flu choke. Yeah, a lot of, a lot, yeah, a lot of uh, high names. Nick Newell fought, uh, was given a really good competition in Joe Condon. Um you know, uh, lot one twenty nine twenty eight across all the uh, scoreboards. That makes sense. Joe Condon did give him trouble um, on uh, on the ground, uh, even despite where Nick Newell shines. You know, and plus he was able to uh, you know give Newell a, a decent striking match. You know, it's, uh, we were talking about this. It's always odd that you know guys can't seem to take full advantage of the fact that one part of his like one side of his defense is is kind of flawed in the in the sense that he doesn't have an arm to defend completely. So. Uh, you know, um, but it is odd that he's right-handed, of course, because that's the only arm that he has. And but he fights like a softball. Makes it very difficult for people to, to take advantage of that opening unless they are themselves uh, a softball. So, you know, um, I can see where why uh, why he, he uh, why fighters have a hard time with him. Um, Nick Newell put in another win. What did you think of his performance? I thought Newell looked good, um, and. Good against a Joe Condon that really wasn't, you know, bad at all. And Joe Condon had some really nice moments in there where he was uh, uh, making it work with his striking. And, uh, you know, he even tried to grapple with Nick Noel, which, I mean, strangely, it, it's dangerous to do that. It's very dangerous to do that with uh, Nick Noel because, um, as uh, Henzo pointed out in his commentary, I mean, uh, Nick Noel uh, presents a whole different uh, leverage that uh, most fighters, that any other fighter, uh, you know, presents, you know, having, you know, both of his uh, arms. So uh, Nick Newell is very nice to go down to the ground with and try to grapple with, but uh, Joe Conner tried it anyway, so props him for that. Uh, I think the right man won. I think the score, the judges scored it correctly. Uh, there were, uh, there, I gave one round to uh, Joe Condon for sure, but um, overall that was just a nice fight to watch. Yeah, Nick Newell is generally always an excited fighter to watch. Um, I, I can't think of a time where he's been in there that I wasn't excited to see him fight. So, you know, whether the Legacy FC days, his World Series of Fighting days, he's must-watch TV uh, at this point. I mean, he's really an excited fighter to watch, just like Justin Gaethje is, you know. Um, yeah. So the lightweight division in World Series of Fighting is certainly, uh, certainly getting exciting, especially at the opener of um, – at the opening of the main card, Ozzy uh, – <laughs> I hope yeah, I said that right. Yeah. yeah, took on Lucas Montoya, and man, you see that broken arm TKO. Broken arm. Yeah. Yep. Oh, horrible, but man, it shows you, man, that dude can kick. And even prior to that fight, he had another uh, victory in the, under the World Series of Fighting banner. He's looking hot. Who knows? That could be next for Newell or Gaethje. Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen next uh, with the title? I can't really say who Gaethje gets next. We'll see. Newell could get a rematch. We never know. Um, he could. He could. Also, uh, in the heavyweight division, Steve Mako, former uh, NCAA uh, Divisional uh, One All-American, took on Giuliano Cotino, and holy crap, he took he had his yeah, way with that right. dude. Man, 
his striking needs work, but hey, he's he's still green, you know. He's still got time to work on that and get on that. But man, that ground and pound, oh, yeah, it was brutal. Was sick. Beat the fuck out of his face. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, Mako was just—he said it himself. He was trying to present something other than wrestling to kind of throw uh, Coutinho off, and it, it kind of worked. Uh, Mako showed really, really good footwork in there uh, that you know you don't normally see from. Uh, fighters that are predominantly wrestlers. Or he heavyweights. Of... What's that, Nick? Or heavyweights. Yeah, yeah, he showed some excellent footwork. So uh, yeah. I, I was really, really excited to see Marco get in there and uh, do what he did. That was awesome. Yeah, as long as he, you know, works on his, his striking as well. It's not as technical as it could be, but he's at American Top Team. He's at one of the best gyms in the world. So, you know, I'm sure that uh, he's working on that and, you know, yeah, yeah, that up with give him, him some. Other, sure yeah, give him some more time. Who knows? He could be one of the more dangerous fighters com- uh, coming up uh, in the future. And then, uh, yeah, you know the way his footwork worked out for him. If if he learned that much from him and got it down that well, I have no reason to believe that his striking won't improve. Oh, for sure, definitely. And uh, of course, um, and I also want to say this: Sal uh, Sal Almeida. Jose Aldo's uh, a translator over the course of the world tour, uh, the UFC world tour, fought uh, on the on the undercard. Didn't do didn't do too bad. His striking uh, certainly uh, uh, had had its uh, troubles against Chris Foster. I mean, Chris Foster, uh, predominantly a wrestler, kept taking Sal down. It was a close close fight, and uh, you know Sal barely got away with the decision. But um, kudos to him for that win and. Uh, you know, actually, I contacted him about coming on to the podcast after the show, and uh, he seems interested. Hopefully, we can get him on here. Um, and then, uh, of course, on the main card, Phoenix Jones made his uh, long-awaited debut. But uh, I'll say this, Emmanuel Wallow, shut that down. <laughs> yep, I try and derail. Absolutely yeah. shut it down. I mean, Jones had some moments in there where he was just uh, winging his punches, just going for the fences with it. But... Uh, Emmanuel Waller just showed so much more skill, and uh, Phoenix Jones couldn't stop a takedown to save his life. I mean, it was it was that bad. Uh, not that Phoenix Jones is a bad fighter. He came, he came in with a very good record, uh, even, you know, not counting his Ami records. His uh, pro was 5-0-1. Am I right? Yeah, so that was his I mean, first loss of his pro career. First loss of his pro career, but, you know, Emmanuel Waller just – he didn't care what kind of superhero antics he's done. He <laughs> went and put him on his back, and uh, Jones couldn't do much. Couldn't do much at all. He had some really nice moments when they were standing. He landed some really hard shots uh, with his punches, but outside of that, I, I really wasn't impressed with Phoenix Jones. Yeah, it was more so because, you know, Wallow shut, shut him down on the ground. He took him down. He didn't let him do much. He was very heavy on top, and he uh, – I mean, his, he could have thrown more punches on top. He could have probably transitioned a little better instead of just, you know, being contempt to stay in his guard. But, um, you know, of course, it, it was effective enough to win him the fight. So, you know, I, I, I would like to see Phoenix Jones get in there, maybe against another striker, just to see how up to par he is with, with somebody uh, with similar skill set as his um, on the feet. So, you know, yeah. obviously yeah, his grappling needs really work. Crazy. I feel like, you know, the World Series of Fighting should just uh, try and give him some welterweights that are, are more striking oriented, see how he does against them. If uh, if he's up to par with them, then see if by that point he's uh, improved his wrestling enough to take on the, the bigger league guys who are uh, more well-rounded in the sense that they can strike and uh, grapple. So, um, I don't know, I'm sure we'll see Phoenix Jones in there again. Um, you know, I can't imagine that the contract he got was for one fight only, so. Yeah, we'll see how it does. You know, um, World Series uh, fighting going uh, coming up next, and of course, uh, you may not have heard it, but we had Clifford Starks on here um, calling out the man of the hour in the main event, David Branch, who took on Jesse McGilliot, who was supposed to take on Ronnie Marks, but got given uh, Jesse McGilliot moves one step closer uh, to the light heavyweight belt now, and now we have the middleweight champion David Branch taking on uh, Teddy Holder for the title. I mean, uh, how do you think that fight's going to go? That, um, I, I don't see any Cinderella stories happening here. Uh, David Branch just is far and away better. Uh, he's showing why he's a champion in middleweight, and I think that's going to translate very well against the competition he's up against right now. 
I mean, Teddy Holder did, you know, he ate some really nasty shots against Tiago in their fight, and he, he was just able to hold on and get his back. And, I mean, that was awesome. Uh, but I don't see any kind of miraculous stuff happening for uh, Teddy Holder against uh, David Branch whatsoever. I think he's too good. I think it's just that, man, I mean, while he can hang on the feet now, and he's gotten better there, his grappling has always been his absolute, you know, yeah, that's his bread and butter. Yeah, so. of course. You know, and sure enough, you know, he's looked terrific in in all these past fights. Uh, you know, in, in his time uh, away, for, ever since he left the stint in the UFC, he's just been on a roll. I mean, his only loss since has been to Anthony Johnson, and you know that's yeah. Anthony Johnson. So <laughs> since then, he's beaten uh, you know all kinds of big names like Paulo Filo, Jesse Taylor, Yushin Okami. And, uh, you know, he's, it's just, it's only getting bigger from here for him. And, uh, you know, we'll see how he does see if he gets that belt. And, uh, you know, again, a uh, shout out to Clipper Starks who was on here. Hopes he, uh, hoping he can get an opportunity at the middleweight, uh, uh, opportunity against, uh, David Branch in the future. Um, moving on to the Bellator card, Bellator 136 also went down at the same time. Uh, the fights here were also, uh, mix and match as far as like you know excitement goes um the first fight on the card i gotta say uh what was his name tony johnson tony the hulk <laughs> yeah yeah not bad i mean his wrestling looked great i mean he really put it to him it was a tough fight for both men you could tell um but i i certainly had a lot of fun watching it and uh, i gotta say this as well will brooks let's talk about that fight first will brooks versus dave jensen oh that was a great main event it was that. It was. Back um, before, Dave Jansen started off strong. He did. Very uh, strong. Was, I was really, really impressed with how he started off. Uh, he kept a pace that, uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to keep for the duration of the fight after the first five minutes. But uh, had he been able to do that, gosh, there's no telling who would have won because uh, Dave Jansen was just hitting some really, really nice punches and kicks and uh, just really going for it and kept uh, – just kind of threw uh, um, Will Brooks off of his game, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was impressed with that first round, but uh, Will Brooks, being the champion he is, being the fighter he is, he uh, adapted and made the adjustments he needed to and uh, dominated the rest of the fight. Yeah, for me, I had scored it. Jabe Jansen went in the first round. I mean, he can't, he wasn't playing around. He came forward utilize the pace that Brooks wasn't able to, to, to really compete with. I think if Dave Jensen could have kept that same pace throughout the whole fight, he could have won. But uh, oh, yeah. obviously oh, yeah. obviously couldn't do that. And Will Brooks was able to uh, maintain composure, stayed in there, saw that saw that Jensen was slowing down, and then you know showed what's what, and uh, of course defended his uh, lightweight belt for the second time. And uh, has now started to really establish himself as a champion in the, world, or in the Bellator banner. And so um, – Man, with that, uh, we'll see what's up. And you know what? Um, another lightweight that had a, tr a, a tremendous uh, uh, performance was Marcin Held, who took on Alexander Tiger Sarnivsky. And let me tell you what, Sarnivsky is no joke on the ground. We know that. But yeah. holy hell, you know, it was a, it was, that was also probably to me the, the second or third most exciting fight on the card, mainly because it was such a grappling uh scramble of a fight that I just love and I love watching those and you know me when I'm watching stuff like that and I'm rooting for somebody oh I have a blast and so uh, you know Marcin Held was uh, holding his own on the ground against uh, Tiger and not only that found many advantageous positions in the second round trying to find uh, leg locks and such and Tiger was fighting him off and then the round three comes around and wow I like it you know and he gets the knee bar Oh, and you know how much they hate those. But he was able to get it, got the legit tap off of Tiger Sarnivsky. That's a legit guy on the ground. And he was able to tap him out. And uh, with that, I think Marcin Held is, should be next. I think it should be Will Brooks and Marcin Held next. You know what I mean? And um, I got to tell you what as well. Um, Marcin, uh, Marcin Held uh, has only lost to Dave Jensen thus far. And, uh, you know, but that was a while ago. That was about three or four years ago or so. And uh, so since then, you know, Marcin has obviously uh, changed up what he's needed to, made the adjustments, done right by it. And, of course, it's, it's still a threat on the ground. And um, we're actually hoping to have him here on Wednesday uh, to come onto the podcast and talk about that potential fight. 
which uh, I can't wait for. I'm very excited to have him on. And um, you know what? Uh, did you see the Marcin Health fight? No, I didn't make it home in time. Oh man, yeah. Oh, you caught the uh, co-main event though. I know that. Yeah. Rafael yeah. Carvalho versus Joe Schilling. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Have your Kavan stitch him up. Yep. Yeah. Was uh, it was it was a great fight. Like I thought it would be, but Rafael Carvalho brought uh brought his, his grappling to the scene as well. He wasn't gonna just strike with Joe, and I think that was smart because there were times where Joe was able to show his counter striking was uh was was up to par to to, to probably put Rafael back, and he noticed it, and he didn't want to risk it, and took uh took it took advantage of his grappling advantage, and was able to you know. Put it to Joe Schilling, man. And let me tell you what, I mean, Joe Schilling, while being an expert kickboxer, MMA is a whole totally different animal. There was nothing wrong with what Rafael did and what he brought to the table and was able to, uh, you know, of course, get the uh, get the decision. I felt he won the decision fair and square. It was, it was a good Thank fight. You. Not too, you know, it wasn't like he destroyed Schilling. Schilling held his own and, and with a guy as experienced as Carvalho, more so over than, than him in MMA. Um you know, I, I, I'm always going to be excited to see Schilling fight, so I can't wait to see him get back in there. I know he has another glory fight scheduled up in the summer, so can't wait for that. And um, whenever he's down to return to MMA, uh, I'll be excited to see it, you know. Should be interesting. And, and uh, let me tell you what, another star of this card, and you may not agree because I don't <laughs> – you didn't, you don't seem to like his head, but uh, Joey Beltran was in this fight. <laughs> Joey Beltran. Joey Beltran, right. man. And he became the first fighter under the Bellator banner to fight in three different weight divisions, which was one was heavyweight, the other light heavyweight, and then uh, and then moved down here, and he's now at uh, middleweight. And let me tell you what. He actually looks really good at middleweight. He looks in shape. He looks like a like an athletic human being, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, before then, you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't seem like he had the most athletic build. Now he looks like a healthy guy who gets up and works out and jogs in the morning. He looks like that kind of guy right now. Um, I'm sure in the future, if he continues to work on his uh, his uh, his uh, you know his physio you know his, his body, you know he he'll be able to really really get in great shape, and I think it'll help. He's already got decent cardio for a guy who used to be the size he was at heavyweight. You know what I mean? And um, and showed it in this fight went went three grueling rounds with this guy and kept putting it on him and uh especially with the guy as dangerous as brian rogers you know he's just got to really continue working probably work also more on strength and conditioning and maybe a little on uh, on you know on boxing and being able to stiffen up his, his punches and and really uh putting power into them because you know he's got power for sure but he's got to work on being able to throw that knockout kind of punch you know what i mean because yeah. you, know, you saw the highlights he was putting he was putting it on rogers man and um it was a great fight overall. My, I was very excited, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what he does at middleweight. I wouldn't be surprised if he puts some uh, a string of wins together like that. He's gonna get a title shot again, uh, this time at middleweight. So we'll see what happens. Um, that being said, you know that this card was great. Which 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 moment of the weekend was the highlight for you? Um, I would have to go with uh, Will Brooks and uh, Dave Jansen. That that fight was really good. Uh, even for the first round with uh, it being more competitive, uh, Dave Jansen showing more uh, competitive uh, spirit in that fight. Uh, and unfortunately, just not being able to continue that on, that, that kind of was a downer for the fight. But overall, just seeing Will Brooks uh, handle himself and basically come back from the first round, that was great. Yeah. I mean, Jansen. what I saw. Now, from, as far as uh, what I didn't see, uh, you got to have to give it to Crow Cop. Uh, slaughtering Gabriel Grunzaga in the you know third round of that fight. That I mean, th you really can't top that. Yeah, the return of a legend. Ugh, you know what I mean. Yeah, being able to give Father Time a little push aside is always exciting for most fans these days. Whenever uh, some of the some guys from the old guard can come around and still put it down, you know what I mean. Um, seeing him doing it outside of the UFC was good and all, but you know he he had a chance to really. Um, really just go to Bellator and make money there and, and probably, you know, to, in most eyes, including my own, uh, would have probably had a better time with better with easier competition, in my opinion, and, uh, you know, could have, could have really uh, finished out his career strong in Bellator, but he, he, he said, nah, I'm cool, let me go to the UFC, and I always thought there has to be something to this. 
there has to be a reason. There has to be some kind of strong motivating factor for him to want to go back to the UFC. And it's either because he's got a, this competitive fire that maybe he didn't always have while he was in the UFC, that maybe he lost from his pride days. I, I thought there had to be something. Like, I just wasn't convinced that he would just go to the UFC without there being something he was bringing to the table this time around that he didn't the first time. You know what I mean? And uh, and I feel like I was right. And not only because, you know, he had a hard time with Gonzaga, sure, but, you know, he started slow. And I think, you know, in an interview and, and, and at the end of it, he said, look, it was my it was my idea to start slow. I didn't want to give him any advantages in the first round that he could take uh, take over later on, especially if I tired out. And sure enough, you saw him, he tired out and I was able to take full advantage. And so everything worked to my advantage. And, you know, I can't wait to get back in here. And to hear that from Crow Cop, it, it excites me. It, it, it makes me think, look, you know, age can sometimes just be a number. Sure. I mean, it look look yeah. what it did for Randy. You know what I mean? He retired momentarily at 40 and then came back at 42 or 43 and took on Tim Sylvia. You know what I mean? Um, right. You know, everybody's different in the same sense. There's a lot of people, of course, who are come to that age and they just can't compete like they used to. Not everybody's like that. And I think Crow Cop can certainly be one of those exceptions. Um, so seeing him come back uh, against whoever it, it will be at the and, and we'll know in the future sometime, um, I, I'll be excited for it. And of course, you know me; I'm a huge Crow Cop fan. You know, a lot of us over here at MMAD are huge Crow Cops fans. And uh, you know, if he did decide to retire, that'd be cool. Uh, I really doubt it. He looks too motivated, too hyped up, too ready to keep, get back in there again already. Um, so you know, of course, yeah, that was definitely probably the biggest highlight of the weekend. Um, on a card that certainly didn't, on paper, uh, appease fans more than than the Bellator or World Series of Fighting card may have, um, but it ended up giving out the best highlight, sure. And so with that, you know, a great weekend of fights, and oh man, it was a lot to watch for sure, <laughs> a lot to keep our eyes on. And so you know, it's fun when they do that though. I like it when you know, especially when the World Series of Fighting and Bellator compete against each other, I am interested in seeing, you know, which numbers won out, especially because, uh, you know, the, the both events ended around the same time. I would like to know which, which event ended with, with the strongest numbers. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it was Bellator, um, but, you know, World Series of Fighting had a decent card. They certainly had a hard run with the fact that their main event co uh, fighter, uh, Ronnie, got pulled out. But they still had uh, attractions such as Phoenix Jones and Nick Newell on the card that really could have uh, um, made it a, a, a tough bet. So, you know, with that, yeah. which card do you think – which card uh, between uh, between Bellator and World Series of Fighting only, which one did you think was better? I'm about to give it to the uh, Bellator card. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, the main event, yeah. five rounds of a, of a great fight like that certainly makes a difference. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I have to give it to, I have to, give it to Bellator. Uh, strictly on uh, the main event, holding together. And also, uh, you know, Marcin Held and Tiger Sonoski. And also uh, uh, Joe Schilling and uh, Rafael Carvalho. So those fights, those fights alone kind of made it uh, what it was. Definitely. I mean, uh, with that being said, I, like I said, this was a great, great weekend of cards. And like I said, I do like it when th when the, the top three events go at it, put on events, especially when they go uh, against each other. You know, number two and number three going at it. I like it. Certainly shows that there's so much to watch. There's a lot of of uh, fun that is to be had in the world of MMA. And uh, man. We'll see what's up next. The World Series of Fighting kind of has given themselves a break, though. They will not be on the air until June now. Right. Um, on the card that uh, that Yushin Okami was supposed to fight Ryan Ford at, at middleweight. Now that Ryan Ford is out, as we said, Clifford Starks, yeah. as you heard on the podcast earlier, Clifford Starks is calling him out and wants that shot. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing it. Clifford Starks has looked great since coming off the UFC. Two submission wins, fought for Bellator, won all those fights, came to the World Series of Fighting, won his first fight, and uh, in spectacular fashion. Why not give him that shot? Give him the opportunity. I want to see it now. Um, that being said, we'll see what happens, and we'll see how this tournament uh, between uh, finals between uh, Branch and Teddy Holder plays out. We'll see, you never know, especially in this sport. You never know. I would love to see if Teddy Holder could get that upset. That'd be pretty crazy. 
Um, well, yeah, it, it would be crazy, but it would also be crazy to see the very first uh, professional dual title holder in any promotion. So, well, in a know. major promotion, you know, World Series of Fighting is considered a major promotion. There's been dual championships before, uh, very rare, like uh, Tony Gonzalez for King of the Cage or for, uh, you know, uh, I know there's another example I'm not remembering right now. Oh, uh, even Ulysses Gomez for Tachi Palace. He held both belts at the same yeah. time. So, you know, uh, it, you know, for him to hold it at the same time, two belts at the same time for the World Series of Fighting, it's a big deal. You know, it'd yeah, be a bigger they, deal they if it was like if it. it'd be a bigger deal if it was if it was like the lighter weights. You know, where undoubtedly the better competition is for for that promotion. But uh, regardless, it, it's a it's a big thing in general for Branch. Um, you know, long term, it's going to help him out. Uh, and if he can really succeed in defending both titles in the long run, man, he's going to look. He's the one who comes out looking like a like a great uh, on top in the end. So, uh, lucky for him, the things are working out. And uh, you know, if he does win the belt, there's still a lot of good fights to be had, such as against either Matt Hamill or Ronnie Marks, or um, or at middleweight against possibly uh, Starks or you know. Um, any of the other middleweights out there right now, probably Ryan Ford if he comes back. Who knows? Um, a lot of fun to be had in the future for both promotions. So, you know, with that, we've covered all our bases here on the fight cards that have uh, been great this weekend, man. UFC on Fox 15 uh, is going to go down. Unfortunately, we've lost the addition of Yoel Romero versus Jacare Souza, and that sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it sucks. Yeah, yeah sucks so suck. much. It's like that fight's. You say it all the time. It's like that fight this is just not definitely destined. never happened. Oh. And that 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 would be an amazing fight. That would probably be one of the biggest fights at middleweight ever in the UFC. You know, uh, outside of a title match, that would be a huge. That's a huge non-title match. Definitely, and um, you know, mainly because it's just those two are just so cream of the crop right now. In that they have great striking, they have. Uh, Excellent grappling. Um, excellent grappling. They're they're just so exciting to watch, no matter where the fight goes with them. And uh, yeah, you know, it's man, I can I would love to see it. It's got to happen sometime. I hope. Please let it happen. Injury bug. Fuck you. Oh. <laughs> All the way up your ass. I hate it. It sucks. You know. And uh, I mean, this year hasn't been as bad as last year or 2012. So. Um, but you know, just you know, keep it down, keep it down. You know, don't hurt this fight. You know, don't hurt other. You know, as long as it doesn't affect the main card fighters or fighters or fights that affect you know the title, especially you know any fight that gets bummed with injury that sucks. But you know, a fight like that, oh, that's just we're dying to see. You know, and uh, and now Chris Camozzi is going to be taking the spot of Yo Romero and rematching Jacare Souza. Good luck to him. <laughs> you know, the first fight did not go Kamozi's way in, in, in any way. So we'll see what happens. I mean, Chris Kamozi, since being cut, has won two fights um, outside of the UFC, both first round finishes. Uh, so, you know, and hey, anybody who's willing to say, fuck, I'll fight Jack around a week's notice has got some balls. So can't dock him there. <laughs> yeah, can't dock him there. But, you know, there's a thin line between bravery and foolishness. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see where all, what side of that line he falls on after uh, after Saturday. But um, obviously, I'm picking Jacare to win that. He's just on a roll. He's absolutely on a tear. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens, man. Uh, uh, I certainly feel that Jacare wins that. I mean, I mean, he took the fight strictly because, you know, of course, he was preparing for a fight, did the camp, and it's a week out. Give me somebody, you know what I mean? So I'm sure yeah, Jacques Ray is very confident that he can go in there and win it. But, man, he's risking a lot at the same time should Chris Camozzi pull some wild upset out of nowhere. And let me tell you what, hey, man, right. this year has been crazy with upsets already. You know what I mean? Um, there's been a lot of big upsets this year. I mean, it, more so this year, I think, than, than any year in the past that I can remember. You know, so – uh, I'm not saying that that should mean anything, but it should be taken into account for sure um, that, you know, anything can happen. We'll see. Especially uh, when something as big as a title shot is on the line. You never know. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. I, I guess you're trying to roll that into 
you're expecting uh, Anthony Johnson to get that upset on John Jones this year too. Oh, uh, well, know. that's not even an upset in my mind. All that's right. that's not. Even, <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's not even an upset. It's going to happen. Oh, It'd be an upset if John if Jones wins, in my opinion. That's what I think. Jones. <laughs> well, there you there go. You, <laughs> according to your logic, this has been the year of the upset. So uh, if John Jones wins, you were right. <laughs> I've been right. I'm always right. I'm never wrong. I don't, no, I'm just, I'm yeah, you're right no matter what happens. <laughs> but no, you probably uh, when you're right when Jones beats Johnson. Yeah, man. I just I, I feel that, you know, of course, I've said this out loud. I think Johnson wins very, very vocally about that. But um, I just think that, you know, I, I'm not dumb to the idea that Jones also wins that fight. There are ways he can win that fight. Um even in the even in when he's in trouble, there are times where he can win that fight. And Johnson needs to treat that fight as such that until the ref pulls him off of him, that fight is the fight of his life for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right about that. And you know, it's a matter of you know, not even a matter of uh, you know, can he finish him? He can finish him. We know that. Can he contend with the rest of his skill set? Striking, I feel like John Jones is of course going to want to utilize reach. He's probably going to want to fight that fight like he did against Rampage, where he kept them so far. But you know, Johnson is just a, a whole other animal right now than, than Rampage was, and so you know, not that I can assume that Jones will treat him like that, but I, I would think that he would come in with a, a striking game plan similar to that. All Johnson really needs to do: keep your back off the cage. Anybody that is listening to me, tell Johnson to keep his back off the cage. That is where John, Jones gets. Like ninety percent of his takedowns, you know what I mean? Um, it's crazy, and uh, you know what I mean. I just uh, man, I, I can't wait to see that fight. Uh, I you know what I'm doing is when I when I when that fight does happen, I'm taking a hundred bucks with me in cash. I'm not spending it on anything unless Johnson wins, and if he wins, I'm putting a hundred bucks down on shots for everybody in that bar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna run around like a little girl, and it's gonna be awesome. You should have seen me when I freaked out when Weidman beat Silva, because I was calling that. Me, Zach, and Blaze, we were all calling for it, and uh, and Chris, of course, too. We were all calling for um, that Weidman was gonna win that fight. We said it, we vo- we vocalized it as best we could at the time, and sure enough, it happened. So, and I'm and I I seem to be the only one thinking it this time. I mean, I know I'm not the only one rooting for him. I know that other others amongst us are rooting for Johnson as well. Uh, but I seem to be the only one that is coming out loud saying it's going to happen. Watch it happen. It's going to happen. And when it happens, I'm going to be like, I told you so. Oh, I'm going to lose it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting too excited right now. we got to change the topic before I get a little crazy. <laughs> I'm just – my heart rate is going up. It's not good. And <laughs> <laughs> Man, I can't wait. It's going to be great. And, man, that's, what, nearly a month away. That fight is March, May 17th. It's April, what, 12th, 11th, 12th? April yeah. 12th, yeah. Oh, can't wait. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. With that being said, I think we've covered all our bases. Anything else you want to discuss before we head over to the fan questions? Uh, you can go and get to the fan questions. All right, then. First fan question, uh... Let me see. Let me see. I'm loading it right now. One sec. My bad. Any second now. Okay. First question. This is actually a good question for you. Who do you see beating um, the next? Uh, oh, wait. Wrong question. Who do you see beating Rafael dos Anjos uh, next, if not Khabib Nurmagomedov? Hmm. So if not Khabib, if not like say not, Khabib, say Khabib's next, which Khabib, I, which he's not yeah. right now. I mean, people want to give it a given since he's fit, taken on Cerrone, and let's be real, that style does kind of play to Khabib's strength in that he can take Cerrone down and probably keep him there. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't, I'm not even convinced. You know, I'll be rooting for Cerrone. Uh, that is a tough fight for him. I'm not saying it's a fight that Cerrone can't win for sure. So. With that being said, I think Cerrone could win that fight. If Khabib wins and then takes on Dos Anjos and loses, uh, that is a tough one, huh? Yeah, that's tough. I mean, that's really tough. I mean, I, I honestly have Khabib beating RDA. Mm-hmm. 
I, I have him beating uh, Cerrone and then going on to beat RDA. So that I don't know how much of that question really applies to me and my thinking. Well, I, I just know that you're a big fan of both Rafael and Khabib. So. Yeah, I am. I'm also a big fan of Cerrone. Uh, Cerrone had an exception all year last year. Um, you know, winning four fights. And, uh, you know, he almost had five fights in the same calendar year. But, you know, he took that one fight in uh, in January, the very first fight in, of the year, I believe. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I I really just, I mean, if Cerrone beats Habib somehow, some way, then, yeah, I think I think Cerrone has what it takes to beat RDA. Yeah, I hear that. I would actually believe that, yeah. I mean, Cerrone just did not look like himself the first time they fought. Not that. I mean, Rafael did great, but it wasn't like he shut him down. It was more so Cowboy just didn't go into that fight 100%. Yeah. You could just tell. He wasn't as aggressive as he usually is. He wasn't as um, fired up whenever he's getting hit. Whenever, whenever the fight turns up, Donald Cerrone turns up. And he didn't do that in that fight. You know what I mean? And... uh so for me, I just I feel like that first fight, not a fluke. RDA won it fair and square, but I just feel like uh, Cerrone, if given that fight again and was ready, especially if there's a title on the line, you know, um, would certainly bring 110 percent, and it would be a different fight for sure. Um, but yeah, with that being said, I think Donald Cerrone, if not Khabib, is the only guy that I can think of that can beat RDA right now. RDA is just on fire. Especially with especially with a coach like Cordero in his in in, in the back, man. Oh, he's like he's becoming the Brazilian Greg Jackson right now. He's a, a lot of his fighters are becoming very successful, doing very well, and um, you know we'll see what happens, man. But that's what I think happens, in my opinion. Uh, next question. Let me see from Twitter. At it's sunshine <laughs> asks, wouldn't Oh, come on. Hold on. My thing's being stupid. When do you see Cain Velasquez defending the title on a regular basis? I don't know. We'll change that question up. Like, how do you see him doing against Verdun? Because that's kind of a silly question. Um, <laughs> it's, I don't know. When, I mean, when he stops being so injured, I mean, it's certainly an issue that he's getting injured so often. Um, I think that could really affect his career. Not only, you know, not, not, not as a champion, but as a fighter, you know, having been out a while, that could really do stuff to you, you know? I mean, um, I'm sure he's still training very heavy. I'm still, I'm sure he's still, uh, is, uh, despite the injuries, he's still keeping himself in shape and every, doing everything right. But, you know, there's only so many injuries you can really get through before it starts taking its toll on you. You know what I mean? Uh, I say the same thing about Dominic Cruz. You know, I mean, I know he looked great when he came back from the first ACL injury. Yeah. Um, but you never know, man. And uh, speaking of which, he sp- he's he says he wants to return by the end of this year. You know, we'll see about that. I mean, I hope he can. I hope he does. You know, <laughs> um, but we'll see. Especially because you know he really that fight really uh. Makes put I mean going into this year the bantamweight division was like one of the most exciting topics going into this year and now it's like we haven't seen a title fight we haven't seen Burrell fight Cruz fight TJ fight you know it's kind of the, the hype is really dumbed down because of the injuries hitting hitting that hitting the top five of that division so yep it's tough man but as far as Kane versus Verdum how do you see that fight going Kane and Verdum yeah. um now Verdum has been on a tear. Uh, in his last three or four fights, I want to say, uh, he's, he's been on an absolute roll. Uh, um, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's enough to beat a guy like Kane Velasquez. So, I mean, Kane's just, he's what I call a complete fighter. You know, he, he has the grappling, he has the wrestling, he's got striking down. I mean, the, he just offers so much in so many ways that uh, I just don't see how a guy like Verdun can beat. Kane Velasquez, you know, uh-huh. I don't see it, but I mean, stranger things have happened as we kept saying. I said uh, the same thing about Dos Anjos fighting Pettis, to be honest with you. So that's just me. I didn't think that Hoffer yeah. could beat him standing. And, and I thought that, you know, if it did go to the ground, uh, Pettis would be able to defend himself well, but you know, I was wrong on both accounts. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And he had the same coach backing him. You know, that's what makes that fight more exciting is that, you know, Cordero has just become this really high-profile coach now because of his success, because of the results he's putting out with his fighters. And, uh, you know, that, that has to that has to make you wonder a little bit, like, wow, you know, what what has he got planned for Kane? You know, I mean, if he could do this with Pettis, let's see what uh, let's see what he's got for Kane. So, well, it's gonna be great. I think with that, uh, I can't seem to find any more questions. So I think we'll close out with that. If you don't got any more topics to talk about, um, quiet Sunday thus far, no news to put out. So and uh, yeah. You know, and now it's Monday, so whatever news has come out, I can't wait to talk about it on Wednesday. Where I gotta say this, we're gonna have uh, Bellator possible number one contender Marcin Held uh, coming on um, on the podcast, and I'm very excited about that. It's gonna be awesome. He's a uh, he's thus far been such an exciting fighter in, in the sense that he's he's a great grappler. You know what I mean? He's very dangerous. He's the light he's the lightweight Paul Harris without the dickery of holding on to leg locks too long. So you know, <laughs> that's very true. And well so, it's, you know, it's going to be very exciting to have him on. I'm excited. Uh, of course, I believe uh, Chris Pagman will join us for that one. Um, and for everybody uh, that wants to get a hold of us, you can get hit me up at Nick the Phantom on Twitter. You can hit up Jonas at MMAD, and he'll find it somehow. <laughs> um, of course, yeah, hit up our page, share it, give us a like. Uh, go ahead and comment, see whatever it is you want us to get doing better on this podcast on either YouTube or Stitcher or iTunes. Uh, give us a listen, man. And um, if you do give us a review, go ahead and help us out with that just so you know we have an easier time spreading the word. Um, we're loving our time uh, um, with uh, all the guests that we're having. Again, thanks to Clifford Starks for coming on. Excellent guest. Um and we appreciate having him on. I can't wait to have him on when the next time this fight is announced. With that being said, Jonas, say peace out. We out of here. Later, guys. Thank you.